Work. Uh, we will be conducting this webinar in a Q&A format today. I will serve as moderator. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box or in the Q&A tool in Zoom. I also have a few questions that we collected uh, from audience members in advance. And to kick things off, though, I would like to have each of our company CEOs take a few minutes to tell us what you do. Um, and I will have you go in the order in which I say your names uh, in a moment. So our speakers today are James T. Woodson, MD, FACEP, founder and CEO of Pulsera. Jay Evans, PhD, co-founder and CEO, Inimmune. Jeff Fee, co-founder and CEO, Patient One. And Sarge Patel, PhD, co-founder and president, Fire Diagnostics. And I would now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Woodson to get us started. Perfect. Well, thank you. So Pulsary is a communication and telehealth platform that connects teams. So telehealth is kind of a buzzword right now in the industry, but what really makes us unique is we're able to leverage our network to instantly unite people around to unstable patients patients that are in transition or moving between different organizations, uh, and also uh, for the providers that are in chaotic environments. So this can be applied to things that are as, as simple as a pre-hospital patient uh, delivering an ambulance to a hospital, uh, all the way to mobilizing uh, care teams for things like heart attacks, strokes, trauma victims that can be incredibly complex and even moving across states. Uh, and then ob obviously all the way to um, helping regions as large as states manage the, the uh, pandemic and mobilize appropriate resources. So instead of playing the telephone game that we often play, as you see in that top diagram, our clients were able to use mobile technology and uh, specifically create a dedicated patient channel uh, that they can use to improve patient outcomes and improve their operational efficiencies. So what we've been doing for COVID uh, we've got multiple clients that started uh, even in ground zero there at Seattle. So we've been involved uh, in the response since the very beginning. We recognize that there really wasn't time for many of our communities to prepare, uh, both existing clients as well as, um, as uh, regions that would be new to our solution. So our, our platform specifically for COVID, they leverage telehealth to do things like limit clinic, clinician exposure, uh, they're using it to preserve the PPE that you hear about so much, that protective gear. Uh, they can obviously use it to manage patients remotely and even communicate with family members uh, that aren't allowed on, uh, to the hospital, whether it's for uh, COVID-related process or something else. So one of our uh, more touching uh, kind of early stories was up in Evergreen, allowing family members to say goodbye to their, their loved one, and at least they were able to do so with video. So we, we knew there was a need. We knew that, that um, uh, people needed a platform that was flexible like this. So, so we actually decided to donate all COVID response packages for free. So the response to that was absolutely overwhelming. We've onboarded literally hundreds of clients from anywhere from rural communities in Alaska, all the way through to major metropolitan areas. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, even states. So kind of where are we now in the in the response? Uh, we're kind of in a mixed state right now. There are some regions that are starting to come up for air. Uh, others actually are still onboarding and um, are in the, the preparing for their kind of uh, initial uh, wave and, and uh, uh, kind of apex there. But pretty much all systems now are kind of looking around, even uh, ones in New York are starting to look around uh, as to what's next. So most of us uh, believe this summer is going to be a summer of preparedness uh, where we're, uh, uh, we're basically focused on uh, kind of figuring out what it's going to take to kind of keep this beat down. But if there is another surge coming in the, in the fall, uh, what are we going to do about that? And so we're committed to continuing to help our, our communities rise up to that challenge. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, pass it on to the next person. Next up is Jay Evans. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try to share some quick slides as well about Inimmune. So uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. And thanks for the invita invitation. Um, so 
Should I put this in slides? Can everybody see those slides okay? Uh, we can. Yep. You can? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the uh, uh, president and CEO of, of Inimmune. Uh, it's a company uh, here in, in Missoula, Montana, and it's housed out of the Montech Center. Um, I'm also the uh, director for the Center for Translational Medicine here at the University of Montana. Um, Inimmune was founded in 2016 uh, by a group of scientists that came up here from, from GSK in Hamilton. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little overview of the company, our business model. Um, I'll focus uh, most of my time on what we're doing on, the, on our battle against the coronavirus and a, and a vaccine as well as a drug product that we're, we're advancing. Um, so like I said, uh, Inimmune was founded in 2016 by a group of about 15 scientists that came up from, from GSK in Hamilton. Um, uh, historically, we've had a lot of NIH funding for this team. Uh, over the past 15 years, we've generated about $80 million in, in NIH contracts and grants, and, and they're very uh, active in the patenting space. Um, our team does everything from initial drug design and discovery up through formulations and analytical drug, drug delivery technologies up through immunology and, and vaccine studies. Um, we're pretty much right now spanning the space from discovery to IND, but as you'll learn, we're, we're soon going to move that into uh, clinical, human clinical trial testing as well. Um, uh, we have a pretty deep pipeline uh, from an early stage biotech company. Um, our lead products uh, center around allergic rhinitis, cancer, and then vaccines, uh, which we're talking about today. Uh, we have strong programs in opioid and flu, and now in, in coronavirus vaccine uh, discovery and development. Um, some of our early pipeline technologies, including our vaccine adjuvants, um, our rapid acting uh, antiviral. Um, is actually one that was an early pipeline uh, that might move into a later pipeline stage because that's the one that will also have some efficacy against the coronavirus. Um, we're a small company, um, just started in 2016, but we have a lot of connections that are around the country and around the globe. We have a lot of collaborators. Uh, a couple of these are key in our coronavirus response, including a group at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, as well as at Boston Children's Hospital in Harvard. Um, who are our partners uh, along with U of M and Inimmune and, and the coronavirus vaccine uh, development space. Um, our technology is based on finding things that stimulate the immune response in very specific ways. Um, we do this through looking for patterns that happen naturally in nature and viruses and bacteria that stimulate the immune response. We then use those in combination with vaccines uh, to boost the right kind of immune response or, or how to deliver the vaccine in a, in a way to get a better and safer uh, um, product. Um, a lot of the technologies that are based on are, are, have uh, clinical histories. Uh, for example, MPL, which is an adjuvant that's manufactured here in Hamilton, Montana, uh, just down the road by GSK, uh, is in two licensed products. Um, so these types of adjuvants have demonstrated safety and efficacy profiles in current vaccines. Um, Inimmune is mostly awarded through federal grants and contracts. Um, just within the last couple of years, we've been awarded over $12 million in new NIH grants and contracts. We also have a healthy contract service business, um, which has allowed us to uh, stay profitable from day one, which is very unusual for a biotech company. I think those on the call would, would know that. Um, but we're now moving into a space where clearly we're gonna need some other types of outside capital to help us move some of these lead projects and programs uh, through clinical trials. Um, our coronavirus related programs, um, we have a vaccine program that we have partnered with the University of Montana. Um, this started in February. There was a funding announcement today through the University of Montana uh, for about two and a half million dollars that was awarded that's been applied to this program. Um, uh, vaccine adjuvants and delivery technologies that were discovered and developed in immune are going into vaccines at the University of Montana, which are now being tested in animal models. Um, lead vaccine candidates will then be sent out to Mount Sinai, as well as our partners at Boston Children's Hospital for testing and virus challenge models. And then those lead vaccines uh, will move towards phase one and we'll seek additional funding support, um, either from um, capital investment from investors or from you know, uh, some part of the federal government to help, help move those forward. Uh, the second product we're focused on is an internasal immunostimulant that provides broad protection against a number of viral and bacterial pathogens acquired via the intranasal route. Um, it's very effective against flu and RSV, 
Um, we're just now setting up testing it down at Rocky Mountain Labs at Hamilton um, to see if it's also effective against SARS coronavirus. We expect it will be, and if it is, then that'll be another uh, product that we can quickly move uh, into phase one as a, as a treatment you would take internasally um, for, for a number of weeks um, around the time when you might be exposed to a, a coronavirus or any other uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, so kind of a summary, you know, we're a, a growing biotech company here in Missoula, a pretty good pipeline of products. Um, you know, we're profitable with st steady revenue and job growth here in Missoula. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing that. Fantastic. Thank you, Jay. Next up is Jeff. All right. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. I'm going to move this relatively quickly, but patient one is a um, remote monitoring platform and automated care management tool. We take manual care management processes and automate them and turn them into digital workflows, enabling care managers to manage many more patients than they would be able to do so in a manual fashion. And we marry that with remote monitoring. Um, our platform, we're not, we're not device dependent. We've tried to keep it as simple as possible because the proliferation of in-home monitoring devices is certainly exploding. Um, but what exactly is remote patient monitoring? Um, it's basically any, uh, any, hold on a second, it's not advancing there. Um, it's, it's basically any technology that supports the monitoring of patients beyond the four walls of the traditional clinic. The goal of this is to enable uh, early detection of preventable patient issues, complications, unnecessary ED visits and hospitalizations. It also increases efficiencies for the care management team because it gives you the ability to remotely educate, communicate and monitor the patients. And certainly in the, in the era of uh, the COVID response, uh, the, uh, I think people, one of the things we really haven't touched on yet today is if you look at the U.S. and the lack of uh, the really the slow adoption uh, by the provider community of telemedicine solutions of virtual care models um, has been very, very slow uh, to this point. And I think one of the things we're going to see coming out of this uh, crisis is um, mass adoption of telemedicine and telehealth and virtual care models that we haven't seen to date. The other thing that's important to point out, in addition to providers all of a sudden recognizing the clinical and public health utility of being able to monitor patients in their homes that are certainly at risk. Just because, you know, COVID is, COVID is um, absolutely, I mean, it's blotting out the sun as we currently speak. There are current healthcare issues that are still going on. And so what our solution enables our provider community to do is to be able to tag uh, and, and uh, keep track of those at-risk patients, whether they have congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, in the midst of this, uh, in the midst of this uh, crisis. As you can possibly imagine, primary care has been decimated during this period of time. Most primary care physician offices that we've talked to are down 50%. People are simply not coming in. And I think one of the things that uh, the public is gonna start realizing is, is the majority of things that, that can be done, that is done in a primary care office doesn't necessarily have to be done in person. And so I think that I, we assert that if primary care physicians don't adopt some type of virtual care model into their practice going forward, they run the risk of losing patients because I think patients are now going to demand uh, this. Our basic platform, there's some new codes that uh, CMS has released, and this is important because we assert that this is the largest incentive that CMS, that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services out of D.C. Uh, this is the largest um, incentive that Medicare has provided in the digital health space to date. It's a game changer for physicians that manage uh, chronic conditions and uh, at-risk patients, whether they're primary care or specialists like cardiology or endocrinology. Our solution is a stable SaaS solution that is easy to set up. We, our primary principle is to keep this as simple for the patient and the physician's offices as well. As I mentioned earlier, we transform manual care coordination into digital workflows and we meet the, the uh, commercial requirements for uh, getting paid by these, uh, for these particular codes. There's three different ways that patients can get physiologic data into our system. They can do a manual entry, and so we push notify patients when they, it's time for them to take their temperature. Certainly, we're live with 
Missoula County Public Health, and they're using our solution to monitor patients that have been identified as uh, COVID positive. So they can manually enter in their data if the data, if the actual device in their home, like a pulse oximeter, has a Bluetooth capable. capable we can sync that device with our solution every time they take their data. We can um, <clears throat> we automatically get that data into our system where we track and trend it over time. Um, as this graphic depicts, we've got over 350 devices that we can uh, <clears throat> our pair our solution with that we can get data out of. And as I mentioned earlier, we track and trend that data for the care team and we create automatic rules and alerts around data points that are trending in the wrong direction or if a data point falls outside of a predetermined range, which gives the care teams the ability to manage by exception. So instead of actually having to call every patient that the county's monitoring, they're only having to call the patients or intervene with the patients that are getting off track. So that is um, at a very high level, that's what we do. We, and I think it's important to note that in the in the context of what's going on in primary care and certainly with what's going on in hospitals, uh, getting the physicians and the hospitals paid for some of this work is really important because as you can imagine, the hospitals and the primary care physicians have been decimated. Can you imagine just shutting down 80% of your profit margin uh, service lines at a hospital to uh, brace yourself for a surge? And that's basically what the hospitals across the U.S. have done. So um, it's a, also it's a tool for uh, hospitals to be able to uh, you know, <clears throat> capture revenue for work that uh, should be being done or uh, is already being done, but they certainly in the past have not been able to get reimbursed for. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jeff, and we'll turn it over to Sarge. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarge Patel. I'm president of Fire Diagnostics. We're a Missoula, Montana-based uh, diagnostic development company and uh, we occupy uh, a, a laboratory space in at Montec here in Missoula and uh, the, the, the main uh, focus of the company is developing and commercializing uh, novel technologies for uh, better and faster diagnostics and, and testing in human health and in uh, life sciences and in agriculture. Um, currently, Fire Diagnostics is developing, um, you know, diagnostic solutions for skin cancer, seizure disorders, uh, agricultural diseases, and uh, we just recently started working on uh, neonatal associated syndromes like now. Um, uh, uh, we were established in 2016, but our R&D efforts really uh, gathered pace in 2018, so we're still fairly fairly new at this game, but uh, with the, you know, we, we've developed uh, not what we believe are novel alternatives to uh, traditional uh, testing paradigms uh, that are used currently like PCR in clinical settings. And obviously with this current pandemic and the reliance on those kinds of tests uh, to screen uh, the population, you know, it's really highlighted some of the, the bottlenecks uh, associated with that kind of screening. And what we've uh, done in the, you know, I would say the last month or so is pivot uh, our efforts uh, to, to tackle the current COVID situation and use some of our novel uh, isothermal amplification techniques. So these are, these are uh, uh, diagnostic reactions that, you know, you just have to hold at a single temperature for a short period of time to get a result that um, uh, do away with the need for uh, complex and expensive uh, instrumentation in a clinical setting. And so we're hoping that we can take uh, this particular technology and uh, really apply it to a really broad base of applications uh, away from the clinic. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. This is, you got this is a share screen at the bottom. There you go. There you go. Now we see it. Can you see it? Okay. So um, this slide basically shows the technology that we're currently developing and evaluating as uh, as our answer to helping with the t uh, testing bottlenecks that we see occurring across the nation and around the world. And what we're doing here is basically taking this complex test and making it uh, uh, simple, uh, very few reagents, uh, shortened uh, time to result, and 
a very obvious visual um, uh, uh, result that allows you very easily for anybody to be able to say uh, where someone, if somebody is infected with uh, the coronavirus. And if you look on the uh, right side of that, the test tubes that we have up there are basically our reaction. Um, the top is a control where it's just uh, the, the reaction mix and, and, and a negative control and then various amounts of the virus in the tubes that are yellow. And that's basically the essence of our test. It's basically in the absence of virus, it's red and it changes to yellow uh, in as little as 30 minutes um, in the presence of the virus. One of the other things that this test allows us to do is we've also removed some of the bottlenecks that we're seeing with acquiring samples. So nasal swabs have, and the uh, uh, virus transport media have all been uh, in short supply and very hard to uh, source uh, for a lot of states. And so we're trying to develop this test in a manner that we can remove some of those steps with the requirement for uh, uh, purification of the viral RNA uh, which is currently required for a lot of the current testing that's out there. A lot of the big units, um, the automated units, they perform that uh, in one go, but it's still uh, the, the sourcing for the cartridges and things like that for these systems is, is, is still a bottleneck. And so um, quite shortly, this is, the, this is the assay we're hoping that we can use within the state, um, working with healthcare, uh, facilities like the hospitals around the state, um, obviously the two here in Missoula, up in Kalispell, uh, over in Bozeman, Deepness. We're going to try and see if we can't help them out and get this testing out there. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so you all have a unique vantage point uh, as a doctor, your sci research scientists, entrepreneurs, uh, could you maybe, for, our, for the benefit of our audience, help us describe for us what you are seeing is the wider impact of COVID-19? How has it impacted your company, your field, and, and society um, from your point of view? And maybe we'll start back through um, in the same order, starting with Dr. Woodson. Sure, yeah, there was uh, many different questions in, in that question. So. Uh, uh, so uh, from a company standpoint, uh, the way that it's affected us, it's been kind of uh, business as usual on many fronts um, in that we address a problem that is really highlighted now. And so we have been uh, really undergoing massive growth in our, uh, in our company. Uh, we've had a few things where uh, we responded and uh, just kind of coincidence in time, we're able to roll out a specific feature where uh, we're able to bring the patient onto our, our dedicated patient channel. And so we've seen massive uptake in that that can help turn like 911 calls um, uh, that are done by a phone into a video interaction. And so imagine um, next gen 911 is now being accelerated. So instead of always sending an ambulance, people are now able to do video interactions. Uh, you look at things like a change in the, the regulatory um, and reimbursement environment for telehealth, like Jeff was mentioning, uh, and now we can turn those into billable encounters, but still not send a truck on scene. So imagine the operational efficiencies for things like that. Uh, there have been things in the works um, on the hospital side. Uh, things that are termed community paramedicine, mobile integrated healthcare, there's a new model called ET3. All these things are fancy buzzwords and initials that most of you guys don't know what it means, but uh, the essence of it is decentralization of healthcare. Um, and so everyone has their own solution or group of solutions for established patients, uh, but everybody on this call has been in one of those situations where I just pick up a phone and I call 911, or I wanna to go to an urgent care, or I wanna do blank. Uh, and because of the, the reimbursement is now there, one of the things Jeff was mentioning was the, the problem of poor adoption of telehealth. It's not because patients didn't want it. It's not because providers didn't want it. It's because it wasn't reimbursed. Um, and now the combination of the change in the regulatory environment 
and the change in the reimbursement environment, there is massive acceleration towards, towards that. Uh, so in general, I see a, a, a decentralization of healthcare being accelerated um, uh, is one. I think telehealth is gonna be one of the major uh, drivers for that. Um, I think on the prop, so uh, high level, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of hope that I think is gonna be a, a coming out of the other side of this. I think obviously the big problem we're all struggling with is uncertainty. Um, uh, people are very good, um, even if we don't like change, uh, we're very good at adapting to change when we know what rules we're playing by. Uh, but everyone is scrambling to understand the current environment. And I think that understanding uh, and that uncertainty has really fueled a lot of the fear that's, that's out there. And that has to do with what are, how are hospitals uh, going to be able to adopt, whether it's uh, digital technology like Jeff and I have, or uh, whether it's more what uh, Jay and Sarge have on the, on the uh, therapeutic or diagnostic side. Um, they just don't have any money. Um, uh, there are, they are in uh, dire financial straits. And so I think understanding all of the different means of funding is going to be a key path uh, to helping us navigate the next uh, six to 12 months. Thank you. Jay, what has been the impact of COVID on, on Inimmune and, and what have you seen in your field? No, that, that's a great question. I'll take a little bit different spin on this and try to talk a little bit about the, just the day-to-day -day stuff that has changed at Inimmune and, and, and working through this. Um, our group is a very lab intensive, research intensive team, which means we have 20 people in there at Montech in the lab all the time. Um, and and not you know in office space um, and so we've had to struggle with how to how to manage through as a company ensuring employees and their their family safety while at the same time making sure that the high priority programs move forward which are in the benefit of, of not only the the company but also the community we live in because we're working on a coronavirus vaccine um, so we've really taken measures early to put company policies in place to allow people to work from home whenever possible on projects that would normally be done in the office. I think a lot of people have done that. But we've also put together alternative work schedules. We have people working on weekends now um, there at Montech to try to make sure that the labs are, are, are depopulated in a way that people can social distance. Um, you know, it used to be if people had a cold or whatever, you know, they come into work and now they stay home. Um, We've learned how better to use Zoom like, like this call today and Skype and other things that I think will stay with our business after this thing is done. I think there's more efficient ways to have meetings than always in person. Um, running back and forth between the university and Montech for meetings all the time between our university roles and our company roles was time in a, was a very effective use of time. And I think a, a combination of in-person meetings and, and Zoom meetings when this thing is over um, will actually have find better ways to operate as a company. Um, and so we've had some challenges to work through there. Um, on the other side, I mean, you know, you, you would hate to, in any, but in any instance, say that, you know, this is good for business, but when you're a vaccine company, you know, pandemics and outbreaks and new viruses and emerging diseases are good for business. It's what we do. There's, there's a lot of money and resources coming through NIH, through Gates Foundation, through the DOD, through BARDA, uh, lots of opportunities to apply for grants. Um, and those will continue to cycle through the system over the next few years uh, with all the congressional appropriations. Um, so there's a great opportunity for companies in this space, whether it's Inimmune, whether it's Fire. I assume there's similar opportunities coming through for the computer and tech-based companies and apps um, um, to deal with this different way of, of managing healthcare. So I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, figure out how to navigate businesses through these challenging times. There's also lots, lots of opportunities that are presenting themselves for new funding opportunities for, for small biotech companies in Montana, um, as well as new and different ways of working that maybe we didn't think about until this was, was forced upon us. Thank you, Jay. Jeff, what would you add to um, some of your uh, previous insights? Well, I think um, what's been said so far, um, I agree with everything. And I think uh, James did a really nice job summarizing exactly what I was going to say. So thanks, James, for stealing all my thunder. But I would say just a little bit more nuance to it as it relates to we're still an early stage company. 
And um, we never really start. We, we, when we originally started, we started around the surgical episode of care, uh, trying to make navigating the complexities of the healthcare system easier. And we kind of fell into the remote patient monitoring uh, when CMS released these new codes. And so one of the things that's happened with us is that we've had to spend a lot of time when we're, when we're pitching our product, educating providers that these codes even existed. Um, so one of the things that's happened with the, with the COVID pandemic and crisis is that it created almost as an overnight understanding of the clinical and public health benefits of remotely monitoring at-risk patients in their home. It's better for the healthcare providers. And one of the things we found from the patient's perspective, because of the testing has been obviously not very widespread and a lot of people that have been showing up early on at the uh, focus testing centers may have had symptoms, but they didn't uh, qualify for testing early on. Um, those patients that actually got put on a monitoring protocol, um, they felt better connected to a care team, which served to actually alleviate anxiety which also, when, you, when your anxiety is lower, you're less likely to get scared and leave your home and go seek care um, in a place where ultimately you might be exposing yourself or exposing the healthcare workers. So I think, um, and I said it earlier on in my initial comments, I think that um, it's created an awareness of the utility for what it is that we're doing. And I think to James's point earlier, I think that um, I don't think the genie's going to go back in the bottle when it comes to virtual care models. I think that, you know, when I was at St. Pat's, one of the things that kept me up at night was just the sheer expense of the bricks and mortar. Um, and, you know, we're looking at St. Pat's is going to get ready to go through a pretty significant expansion. And it's a needed expansion. I completely understand it. But one of the things that kept me up is I'm, I was already too expensive. Now, all of a sudden, if uh, we can take the bricks and mortar and turn it into a click and mortar type of model, and where you're really truly moving away from um, having to go someplace and to James's point, decentralizing it, I think my prediction is, is I don't think that that genie's going back in the bottle and healthcare systems are going to have to figure out ways to aggressively adopt virtual care strategies if they're going to stay relevant in their communities. And Sarge, what would you say? Well, and for us, um, being a, an R&D company, much like Inimmune, I, I think Jay uh, highlighted a lot of things uh, that apply to fire as well. Um, being a smaller company, um, you know, we had a very focused view on projects that we believe were important prior <laughs> to the advent of the pandemic. And uh, I think one thing we've learned as a team, it's been a learning curve for us, for a young company, um, uh, how to, you know, assign uh, 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 work and and focus, and in this current time, you know, with the added pressures of, you know, we're asking our employees to come in, uh, you know, they they've made the decision that they want to work on this project, and like Jay said, we're in a confined area in the lab in the offices, and so we have to be uh, very much aware of, you know, our interactions. Um, the one thing that's, you know, I think a real positive that's come out for my company, and I'm, I'm sort of proud of this, is how well we've sort of gelled as a, as a team and, um, and how, you know, we've uh, sort of been able to lean on each other uh, to really tackle a very difficult problem. Um, you know, we see, you know, everybody is trying to work on this testing paradigm for, for this disease. And, um, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of the same out there and we've had to innovate, you know, it's really brought out like the creative juices in the team to figure out how this, how we can tackle this in different ways and really look at the problem from a different point of view in terms of, especially the diagnostics. Obviously I have a very focused view on the diagnostics uh, side of thing. It has affected the way we work, our workflows in the lab, all of those kinds of things, but it's, you know, also, showed us how we can actually perform at a really high level uh, under difficult circumstances. And, you know, when things are limiting to get creative. And so I think um, in, the, in, the, in, in the realm of our company, I think it's, it's really, you know, uh, shown us that, you know, we've got a really good team here um, that can tackle this problem. In terms of what we might be able to, 
you know, to actually, you know, our goal is to really help our community. And, you know, the, the development of this test is primarily driven by um, the current lack of testing that's being allocated to states like Montana. It's just hard to get the throughput and the numbers uh, for screening, as we're seeing everywhere. Um, but, you know, we also have a, a rural environment here. There are people that are away from the metropolitan centers that they, they need testing too. And we're trying to develop something that can be far reaching without the, 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 you know, the requirement for the highly technical kinds of tests. So, you know, I think uh, it's, it, you know, this, this particular pandemic has really helped us hone our vision of how we can, how we can help. Great, thank you. We have had some great questions submitted by our audience members. Uh, some of them are for individual panelists. We'll, we'll cover as many of them as we can get through in the time remaining. And I will tell um, both the, the speakers and our audience that any questions we don't get to, we will email to the speakers so that if they have um, answers that they can contribute in the follow-up, we'll hopefully get you answers to your questions, even if we don't talk about them today. First question, were there any effective antiviral drugs during either the SARS or the MERS epidemics? If so, are any of these effective against the current COVID-19 virus? So this might be for our uh, viral virologists <laughs> on the panel. I can I can partially answer that. I well I haven't read all of the, the literature about the previous Mars Mars SARS and MERS uh, outbreaks. I don't believe there were any antivirals uh, identified at that time that made it through clinical trials. Um, and so the testing that's going on now, you're hearing about some antivirals that have might have some effect. Those are some of the first ones. Um, partially, hopefully, we can learn from that. I think I've, I've heard it over and over again over the last couple of months. There were companies that had vaccines developed uh, for the previous SARS outbreak. And when that outbreak went away, the funding went away. And they didn't move them to phase one because they didn't have funding available. And what investor is going to put money into a vaccine where there's no infection? There's no active infection. Um, so hopefully we can learn from that. And, and, you know, let's all hope that this goes away and doesn't come back next fall. Although I think we all understand that it probably will. Um, let's hope it doesn't. But if, if it goes away, um, and let's say it goes away for good, let's hope this doesn't stop the research that people like SARS and other things that are going on to make sure that when it happens again, which it will, um, we, we know more than we know today. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, this is a pretty specific question. It comes from Jeff Peace at Rocky Mountain Biologicals in Missoula. He says, we currently produce viral transfer media, which I continue to hear is a critical bottleneck for testing COVID-19. Is there a US or global focus group I can contact to reduce time and speed up distribution of VTM to those in need? I don't know if anybody has an answer, but could help out a member of our network. All right, maybe that's one to uh, to pose to. <laughs> if Sarge doesn't know, I don't think anybody. Yeah, no, I, I think we're, we're trying, I mean, a lot, I mean, especially within the state, I know, I mean, I know hospitals are starting to reach out potentially to, to source, and I think uh, their product is being used extensively across the state. I don't know if there's like a central hub, though, that people are starting to, to work through to try and, uh, find sources where people can actually source the material and send it out to where it actually needs to go the most. But I haven't, we haven't really looked at that. Christina? Rajita? Well, I think Bio International might have sort of a platform on its website where kind of matching the, the need with the supply. That's what I hear. And um, probably Sharon Peterson with Montana Bioscience Alliance uh, could could address that question a little further with Jeff. Okay, we'll hopefully follow up um, and, and uh, answer that question. Um, this one is for Jeff Fee. How can we build the remote model around patient outcomes as opposed to existing code reimbursements? How can we turn the focus of healthcare to wellness and early intervention instead of sick reimbursement? That, uh, well, I could spend uh, the rest of the afternoon talking about that, but one of the things uh, that interests me so much in what we're currently doing 
is, and the reason we like these new code sets coming out of, um, out of CMS, it's the first time CMS has actually incentivized physicians to think about their patient panel proactively. Um, if you think about what happens in a physician office, and I started employing physicians back in the mid nineties, I'm dating myself now. And in the economic model that the, the current healthcare system is in, uh, the, the providers get paid to take care of sick people. The more sick people they take care of, the better they do financially. And this, what this particular code set does is it incentivizes the physicians to think about their patient panel the same way a payer would. The payers are financially responsible for their patients. And so by <clears throat> look, thinking about their patient panel differently, they're identifying their patients that are the most at risk and they're gonna, and the, the code set incentivizes those physicians to manage those patients aggressively. And our solution can also use, be used for wellness reminders as well. I spent 10 years trying to figure out a way to change the way healthcare was delivered in the communities we served. To your very point, changing um, the paradigm from a sick care model to more of a proactive well care model. And this is, uh, we believe that these new code set is a significant enough of an incentive to actually start breaking the cycle of the way physicians think about their patients to be more proactive versus just reactive when they're coming at us. So it's a great step towards um, your very question. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so we're running out of time. We will take the uh, remaining questions that haven't been answered and send them via email. Uh, in this last minute, Brigida, would you take one minute and just share your final thoughts on, on this uh, this industry and, and the moment we're in. Yes, let me unmute to do that. <laughs> uh, I guess as a final thought, there are some industries that are tied to geography, but when we're talking about bioscience, it's not necessarily in that bucket. You know, monumental scientific discoveries and cognitive leap forward, you know, those things are not as much tied to geography as they are tied to intellectual capital. And it's individual people that have the presence of mind and maybe even the audacity of spirit to think that they are the ones responsible for making a difference um, and making that next leap forward. So I just wanted to say that I'm grateful to the folks on the call today for being a part of the solution to the COVID-19 crisis and the ones that will inevitably follow. Thanks. Thank you, Brigida. And I would like to echo our thanks to all four of our panelists today. You could not ask for a busier time for us to, uh, to take your time, but I think it's a real gift to us in Montana to get to hear about the amazing work that you're doing and the impact that you're having, not just on our state, but on our, our country and potentially the globe. So we're so proud that your work is happening right here in Montana. Um, and please let us know if there are specific ways that, that we can help all of you or for folks who are on the line that are also in, in this field working on the front lines, uh, please reach out if there are ways that we can connect you to resources or um, opportunities, or if you have jobs available now that business is, uh, is going well, uh, we'd love to post those as well. So thank you all. And uh, there will be a recording and a transcript available to our audience uh, members and the public after this call. So thank you again for your time and your knowledge today.